Good. All right. So, um, so we talked about El Nino, and we talked about um, Rossby and Kelvin waves, and we've got a lot of pieces about Kelvin waves, and then we spent a lot of time, an awful lot of time, talking about the gyres, basically, like the horizontal circulations that are set up by geostrophic flows. So one of the key aspects that we're going to close on when we talk about climate change is the other overturning circulation, the, the circulation that overturns in the vertical. And so one of the, we're going to spend some time today talking about this. And I probably should have, there are, there's more information because there's been a really big push to do research on this recently. Um, over the last five years or so. So one of the possible topics for paper four would be to try and pull together some part of discussion about the MOC. ECHO has a nice MOC. You can diagnose it. There are observations of the overturning circulation now for about a 15-year time span that you can look at in comparison. And then there are, are um, lots of other papers comparing lots of models that are like ECHO and seeing whether their MOC agrees. And it kind of interestingly disagrees with each other and with the observations. So there's a whole lot of mess, but it's an important part of the climate system. So it's something that we think we should be good at, but we're not very good at it yet. So there are a lot of, it's an interesting topic to think about and to think about like, even how do we talk about something that is so under constrained, there is a, I don't think I'm even talking about this today. But anyway, there's a really exciting piece, which maybe we'll have time to talk about at the end. OK, so the meridional overturning circulation. So one thing we're talking about is how overturning differs from the thermohaline circulation, which is a different phrase. How surface properties affect water masses. How the mass and energy transports are estimated. And then the primary patterns of what it looks like, which is sometimes called the conveyor belt. This is a, a phrase that apparently Wally Broker came up with in trying to explain this to a news reporter. He said it's kind of like a conveyor belt. And then they drew it on a napkin. And that became this big theme in the whole discussion of how the oceans work. But actually, it's not a very good word for it, for reasons we'll describe. <laughs> OK. So we've thought a lot about the vorticity budget and about how that drives the gyre. And so we have the spare drip relation, right, which in, specifies the interior flow. And one way to think about that was that we have the stretching term balanced by the beta term. So the meridional transport, that one, is related to the, the stretching of the vortices in the vertical. This is the ice skater effect of if you make them taller, then they will spin faster. And so that would be equivalent to poleward motion if you don't preserve the relative vorticity. We've gone through that argument a bunch of times. And then we, in the Stommel model, we actually put an upper velocity that has to do with the upper Ekman layer and a lower velocity that has to do with the lower Ekman layer and kind of made sense of that, and that gives us a closed solution. Um, the real world is more complicated. <laughs> there are lots of gyres. There are subtropical gyres, there are subpolar gyres, um, and they sort of behave along that line. And this is one, so in some sense, that plus the ACC, which has another kind of wind drill, driven, looks like an, up, an eastern boundary current, kind of like an upwelling current, that gives you a sense of what's going on in the world. Um, but you might have thought all those motions are driven by the wind. And we just kind of say, well, heat is transported by those gyres. And that's the stuff that we did in paper three. It was like, maybe there'd be a freshwater transport, maybe the heat transport. What about the other way, though? Because the way that you might think that the ocean worked was the planet's climate is changing. Things are getting warmer in some regions than in others. Or rain is happening harder in some regions than others. And over a paleoclimate time scales, those probably change a lot. What's the response of the ocean to that? It's not the wind forcing. What about, like, what does the ocean do if you just heat and cool it? And so this concept has been around at least for as long as the wind-driven circulation, and maybe even longer. 
Um, and so the idea was that you would have fresh water and salinity forcing, and then heating and cooling, and then maybe related in a sense we'll get to that there's turbulent mixing and tides might be part of that story. And so each of these would affect the stratification and the horizontal gradients, like dense stuff over here, light stuff over there. And so wouldn't that affect the thermal wind and the transport? And so how does that work? Like how does that side of the story go? Um, and there are a lot of different pieces, but we're going to talk a little bit about water masses. So what is a water mass, first of all? A water mass is a recognizable water type that has a particular temperature and salinity and may, or potential temperature and salinity, and maybe also CFCs or carbon dioxide or something, and you can trace it back to where it was last at the surface based on those properties. And within that water mass, the properties are relatively uniform. So the way that the overturning circulation was originally discovered was by noticing that it looks like, hey, look, there's a big blob of water that's coming down like this. And we talked about this early on. We'll go a little bit more into detail. And you might think, well, if a particular water mass is fresher, or if it's warmer, then that's going to set up part of the currents that are making it move, because we know geostrophy and thermal wind and all that stuff. So maybe that's related. OK, so this is the, these are the vague notions that we want to try and crystallize into a few clearer notions, even though there will be un pieces that are left at the end. OK, so if you just map, this is, this is, this is, diagram has a lot of different names, but I like calling it the plumbing diagram, because this is how the oceans are hooked together, like, as a flow chart, not as a geographic map. Yeah? What's the name we said used to visualize? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's kind of the overturning schematic. If you Google image and you do global ocean overturning, it just will show up and you'll be able to figure out what they are. But here's the funny thing about this. So, okay, each of the spokes of the wheel is a basin. So this is the Indian Ocean. This is the Atlantic Ocean, and this is the Pacific Ocean. And there's, they're ignoring east-west variations across each of those basins. So the gyres are just averaged across. They're just, we're looking at the vertical properties. And that's because essentially the gyres are just mixing the same water, close to the same water, over and over again. And so in water mass properties, you don't see the gyre. It's just all the same water that's going circulating. But if you look in the vertical in, say, the Pacific, there is some Antarctic bottom water, which is very, very cold and, and quite salty. And it's the densest water mass. It's at the bottom. And then above it, there's something called the Pacific deep water. And then above that, there's the Antarctic intermediate water, or, or the um, south, uh, why is it the SAMW? American? No, because it's in the it's in the maybe it's the South American mode water, but I don't think that makes sense. But anyway, this is the southern this is a mode water type. So mode water is a funny name that people use for a water type that is less stratified in the vertical and so has a particular um, kind of temperature classification. But it tends to be at kind of intermediate depths. Um, so the gyre might be circulating this, these kind of waters. Um, and so they're intermediate waters, or there would be a, um, or, or a surface water type, a Pacific, a Pacific water that was even sitting on top of that, and maybe the upper couple hundred meters. So this flow is based on the water properties, not based on the observed flow. So they go down and they say, I'm looking at temperature and salinity, and it looks pretty uniform. And then 
oh, now there's a different temperature and salinity, and it looks like it's got to be going this way, and then there's a different temperature and salinity. And when I go back to the source at the surface, this one is coming from those isopictals actually connect to a surface source. When I go back to the source of this, it's connected to these few locations, just three of them around Antarctica, that make this water under the ACC, and then it comes, it continuously connects. And then this intermediate, the Pacific deep water, looks like it might be a mixture of this guy and that guy. So it doesn't have a so surface source, it's a combination of the one above it and below it that's coming back the other way. And so that's what it's like in the Pacific. Um, and then there's this little loop, which is, has to do with the subtropical cell. So that's really the overturning part of gyres, of the North Pacific subpolar gyre. Okay, and then Indonesian through flow. So you, you, if, you, if conditions are right, you can just leak out of the Pacific and jump into the Indian Ocean. And the Indian Ocean has a kind of similar structure. There's Antarctic bottom water, there's a deep water, which is coming back the other way. There's a mode water that's coming from the Antarctic. Um, and then there is also this Indonesian through flow water that's coming in, runs all the way around the boundary of the Indian and then goes out in the Agullis and sheds rings that go into the Atlantic. So we've seen that in the movie, but this is trying to make it as a plumbing diagram. Okay, so the Indian and the Pacific look sort of similar. There's not a lot going on the North Indian because the North Indian is not very big. But the South Indian and South Pacific look kind of similar. And this actually extends into the North Pacific. This is the North North Pacific, that part. Okay, the Atlantic has something very special happening, right? We have the formation of North Atlantic deep water up in near the Labrador and Erminger seas. So there, cold water comes down and goes back, and it goes all the way to the Antarctic, to the Southern Ocean before it reaches the surface. Even though some of it mixes up a little bit with the surface water that's coming back to receive it, especially near the equator. And then there's also Antarctic bottom water underneath. Okay, so these are all examples of meridional overturning. The velocities are oriented in the meridional direction, and they're overturning in the sense that they're going different directions at different depths. So that's maybe one way to think about the meridional overturning. This is what the conveyor belt version of it is, which is kind of the same story. And I believe the colors are actually meant to be the same as the ones in the last one. But this gives you a different sense because now you're thinking, oh, maybe they're going east-west and things like that, which is true to some extent. But we know there are gyres sitting on top of these. And are these in a boundary current? Are they filling the whole width? Are they, what's driving them? Why are they going where they're going? So we still have a lot of questions. And then another way to look at the overturning circulation is, in a is just in a cross section showing um, temperature, salinity, which I always get this one backwards, and oxygen. So potential temperature, the warmest at the top, coldest at the bottom. And then salinity, in particular, you can see this big tongue of higher salinity water. So if you put this one and this one together, you might say, oh, water got cold here, it fell down, and then it spread out, carrying its salinity with it. So that's the North Atlantic deep water part, and then here's the Antarctic bottom water part coming underneath that. This is just a transect in the Atlantic. So this is another way of seeing it. And then oxygen is a particularly useful one because oxygen it's refreshed at the surface, so all the surface waters have as much oxygen as the water can hold. They're basically saturated. Colder water can hold a little bit more oxygen than warmer water, so the poles have a little more oxygen than the equator. But then after the oxygen goes subsurface, critters start using it up. So this is like a measurement of the age of the water. So this high oxygen water that is also high salinity but doesn't have such an obvious signature in the temperature 
is what I mean by water mass analysis. We find the North Atlantic deep water because it's anomalous in salinity and it's high in oxygen, which means that it was near the surface more recently than the water underneath it that has lower oxygen levels. Does that make sense? So this is the kind of detective work that made this map and this map. But unlike all of our conversations since we stopped talking about budgets, where are the forces? What makes this water move? That part we don't have any sense of in this description. We just know that those water types are kind of consistently hooked to each other. Does that make sense? So we can make a toy model that might have some forces in it, like the force of upwelling at the equator, <laughs> sinking due to cooling, because if we took warm water and we cooled it off, it would end up being dense water. So this is a schematic that has a warm water or a less dense water surface and then a more dense deep water. And so if you cool this water off, it switches which layer it's in, and then it becomes the other one. Or you could lift it up, dense water, up to the surface using an Ekman upwelling. And then once you got it at the surface, you could warm it up and then it would be in the upper layer. So this is a different kind of schematic flow. And you can imagine if you take this conversion and this conversion and this conversion and you add them up so that your steady state, then you could say, well, how, fa how, how fast does this arrow go? Well, this one goes with the curl of the wind stress. How fast is this arrow? This goes with the strength of the easterlies of the equator. How fast does this one go? Well, this goes with the rate of cooling at the surface. So you could try and connect those together. If you do that, you can boil it down to a relatively simple equation to try and get a handle of a little bit of the forces and make predictions even about predictions like how deep is the picnic line? What temperature is the picnic line? Is the water above the pig line? Those are the kinds of things you could say. And then you could say, in paleoclimate, what if we weren't cooling as much up here? What would happen? Would the pig line get shallower or deeper? Would it get warmer surface water, colder surface water? If we make the Southern Ocean wind stronger, what happens? Those kind of thought, this is now starting to link the pieces together. And of course, what that's uh, handled for is some much more complicated plumbing diagram like these that are hooking all these different water types together. And this one actually has all the flow rates in sphere drops and the amount of heat they represent in petawatts, superimposed. So there's a lot of stuff. OK. So <laughs> but all of those are still relatively schematic. <laughs> so let me think a little bit. Hold on. Let me see where I'm going next. All right. So. We talked a little at the very early on about the transformation of surface water near the surface. I'm going to remind you what we said, and we'll, we'll start to have a, a sense of that. So there is, at the surface of the ocean, there is a well-mixed layer that's well-mixed in the vertical that hooks on to the isopycnals below. And we saw this particularly when we talked about the subduction into the, into the subtropical gyre that we had a surface convergence because of Ekman, conver Ekman pumping, and Ekman pumping pumped stuff down. We didn't talk much about what was going on like in the Ekman layer where the convergence was happening. But if you look at echo, or you look at observations, there's all, all kinds of vertical mixing going on that keeps that layer pretty well mixed. So what temperature do you expect that layer to have? If it's well mixed. What can you say about the temperature? Either the same or a gradient from the bottom to the surface deepness. Yeah, so it tends to have a pretty uniform temperature, and then there's maybe a little temperature jump at the bottom. But um, whatever isotherm it hooks into is going to be pretty close to the temperature of that mixed layer that it attached to. There'll be kind of pipelines, because this water was recently sitting inside this mixed layer. So they should match up to some degree. What happens if the air gets really cold? 
or if it turns to winter. Now, what do we, what do we think happens to this mixed layer? It should get denser, it should get colder, and it should go deeper because it would actually connect to a deeper isopycnol that was colder. So these are not fixed at depth throughout the seasons. They're kind of moving up and down and attaching to different isopycnols that are below. And so Here's a movie of the mixed layer from observations. This just shows you the depth of that mixed layer. And in the wintertime season is the deep one. If that makes sense, because it's cool. It's penetrating really deep. And it goes from something like 10 meters up to 1,000 meters, depending on the season. OK? So that steady state picture of a surface convergence that's hooking into a temperature layer is a little funny because what really is happening is the surface layer might get really deep and in wintertime it's hooking into a totally different isopycnol than in summertime. Okay? So that's part of the process. What, do you, what else do we know about that surface layer? What would it have in terms of oxygen? Lots of oxygen. Lots of oxygen. It would be pretty much as much oxygen as it can absorb given its temperature. And so it would, and it would be mi well mixed in the vertical, so it would have a pretty uniform amount of oxygen. So when that water goes down into the isotherms underneath, the isopycnals underneath, it'll take whatever that oxygen level was. So it has a marker of the temperature that it was, and that salinity has a small effect on how much oxygen you can absorb too. That would be part of that water mass labeling. And what about its freshwater content? Also would go down, so you would have a salinity that was a record of like how much evaporation and how much precipitation had it seen while it was at the surface, and then when it goes down, it would go along. In a steady system, it would be pretty easy to relate the oxygen, the temperature, and the salinity. But in an unsteady system, you could have interesting variations, because you might have a particularly cold winter that was also really snowy. And so an isopictal might see fresher, colder water at the same density compared to its norm. So there's both the density is increasing, but then this other combination, cold, fresh, warm, and salty, that doesn't affect the density, called spice. And the unit and the extreme limits of spice go from minty, which is cold and fresh, to caliente, which is hot <laughs> and salty. <laughs> so you put the so spice is kind of this other direction. So you can go on the isopycnals and not only see the water mass where it came from based on its mean, but there's variability. And over time that variability gets washed away as eddies and things mix up the spice and homogenize it out. So the variability is another structure that's getting subducted and carried along these isopycnals. Does that sort of make sense? OK. Is so why do we care? Yeah? Is, sorry, is spice an actual term that I should write down? Spice is a real term. The caliente menti thing is a little bit more <laughs> colloquial. Although I have seen it written in an actual paper. So I, and I will definitely refer to it in those, those, you know. You label your figure of spice goes from minty to caliente. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this is a, so how does the mixed layer get mixed is a question, which is closely related. So you could make a mixed layer just by cooling at the surface, and it's going to go down until it matches its isopycnol with whatever layer it is. So the colder you make it, the deeper it'll go. That's, or, or the, but how deep it goes depends on what the local stratification is. If it was highly stratified, it wouldn't go very deep to get to that temperature. If it was 
unstratified, like a subpolar gyre, it might go all the way to the bottom. So that's part of the story. But the mixed layer is also mixed, having nothing to do with cooling, having to do with winds and waves on the surface making turbulence. And the turbulence tends to bring cold stuff up rather than let cold stuff fall down until it's happy. So you still get kind of a matching, but you get it in a different way. So if we start with, um, let's see, if I draw densities like, suppose we start like this, and this is Z, and this is density. If I cool the surface, I would end up with a density maybe over here, and then I would tend to fall down until I found that level. So that would be my mixed layer depth under cooling. But if I mix, I get a different effect. What happens if I mix? I take light stuff and I take heavy stuff and I make what kind of density? Somewhere in the middle. So this one doesn't give me a jump, but if I mixed from here to there, I'd end up at a density kind of like this. So I would have a different structure to the mixed layer and there would be a jump in density at the base. So you can sort of recognize which one of those features is based on the jump at the base, but as the season goes by, the winds are changing, the waves are changing, the cooling is changing, and so there's a lot of different ways of getting at this. And then there are also processes which are trying to undo whatever this is, because there's energy here that I could get back out if I could somehow manage to sort this and put all the warm stuff on top of the cold, the light stuff on top of the dense stuff, I reclaim some of that energy. So that is the restratification process. Plus the sun is heating up here more than it's heating down here. So when the sun is out, it's going to tend to restratify because this part will be getting warmer faster than this part is getting warmer. So it's a comp what sets in the mix layer is a competition between the mixing processes and the convection processes and then the restratification processes which are coming into some kind of balance over the year. So all of that complexity is going on to the water types that are coming out. And oh, there's one other thing. So. Suppose I'm sucking this water out at the bottom all year, because I've got an Ekman convergence. I've got Ekman pumping. But when I do this mixing, suppose this was the base of the mixed layer to begin with, and now it's moving this fast, but I actually mix faster than that. And my mixing overtakes the rate at which the Ekman downwelling was occurring. I kind of something escapes the mix layer, and then I mix it right back into the mix layer, so it doesn't really get away. So this is the process called Stommel's demon. And Stommel said the only way that it makes any sense to get out of that is you go to the mix layer that is not the annual mean one, but the one that is the deepest one for the whole year. And that's the water type that makes it for sure out of the mix layer. All the other ones might get re-entrained back into the mix layer and get back in that business of exchanging with the atmosphere. So it's only the deepest layer of each year that is the likely to tell you which isopycnals you are detraining, leaving the mix layer permanently and going on to. Does that make sense? So, yeah. So water mass analysis is sort of easy and sort of really complicated. And on, on but the basic idea is you're forming this stuff at the surface, it's jumping down, it's going, and then we can tell that because the water masses are different farther downstream, that there must be some overturning and some other mixing pieces going on. Okay. One of the things we might really care about, the reason why there were petawatts labeled on these little figures. Oh, no, sorry. This little figure. Why does it, why does it matter? Why are the petawatts? What petawatts are units of what? Power. Power. So thermal energy per unit time being taken from place to place. And why do we care about that? It's an important 
It's important for climate because if we measure the amount of energy that's coming in to the planet and subtract off the amount of energy that's going back out to space, it's pretty well balanced over the whole planet, aside from the little bit that's out of whack because of global warming. And, but it's not balanced latitude by latitude. So more energy comes in in the tropics than goes back out in radiation. And more energy goes out at the poles than comes in by radiation. So how does that work? How do we keep a budget that's sort of steady in the long-term, like decadal mean at this equator if more energy is coming in from radiation than going in? The, it is redistributed across latitudes by stuff that's moving heat around inside. So both the atmosphere and the ocean are redistributing energy. So those petawatts that are on the previous label is part of that process. So this is an estimate of just the atmospheric part. If you want to make this work out, you have to take some of this excess source and move it up there. So this is a northward transport of energy from that's basically taking this stuff and moving it that way in order to cancel out this stuff. And then there's this stuff, move it that way and cancel out this stuff. There's a southward transport of energy required. That's the solid line here. Um, and then the dashed lines are an estimate of what the atmosphere does. So the atmosphere looks almost like what you have to do, but it doesn't quite reach it. So that means there's some leftover. So how does it do, how does it do this? Let's be a little before we jump away. How do I transfer heat from the equator to the pole in the atmosphere? A net. So I take moisture. So if I carry vapor one way, rain it out, and then it maybe returns as liquid water, I have transported a lot of heat, the latent heat of vaporization. Every gram carries with it a couple of, is it 500 uh, calories of, there's a huge amount there to that. Or I could take warm air and move it one way and replace it with cold air. I could exchange warm for cold. And if I do that, I'd be net transporting hot stuff away from the equator. In fact, both of those happen. So typically, the atmosphere, what storms do is they take warm, moist, equatorial air and exchange it for cold, dry, polar air over and over again. That's what, the West, that's what storms in our latitudes do. And the Hadley cell does that as well. It takes warm, moist, equatorial air, comes together at the ITCZ, it goes up and it goes out, and then it descends dry, cold air comes in underneath to replace. So that circuit is carrying warm, moist out and dry, cold toward the equator. So in both cases, you're doing this part of work. But there's a little bit left over, which is the ocean part. So how does the ocean do it? All right, <laughs> this one is, which ocean, oh, this is the global. So this is the overturning circulation globally. Here's the Antarctic bottom water, which is carrying, I think this number means 29 sphere drops in this flow. And then there's this North Atlantic deep water, which is about 19 sphere drops, if I'm reading these numbers right, going this way. And then here's this, and then here's this. Are those all the same temperature? Now, so this is now the heat transport part that goes with that. The coldest water is the Antarctic bottom water, which is carrying some number of petawatts this way. Then the North Atlantic deep water is carrying some heat this way. These intermediate waters are carrying heat that way, that way. If you add all this up and vertically integrate those, then you can make a diagram like this. So, sorry, there are two different versions because this is a relatively poorly known thing. So there are two different estimates, but let's just look at the bottom one because I can reach it. Can't reach the top one. Okay. The black line is the total. 
for the ocean transport. And it looks an awful lot like both the atmosphere and what and the difference, like whatever is needed. So it is on that taking warm water toward the poles and cold water toward the equator. And it does it partly in this overturning circulation. And it actually also does it in the gyres, because we know like the Gulf Stream is warmer than the Sverdrup return flow. So there's some lateral part of this, and, but a lot of it is this vertical overchange. Yeah? Did you have a question? Yeah, OK. Yeah? So from a nauseous carried away, the process involved evaporation and precipitation, right? Yeah. These are the two things which you take care of the cycle. Yeah, so there are three different cycles. There's the warm air, cold air. There's the warm water, cold water. And then there's the vapor returning as liquid. And actually, to a lesser extent, there's a, actually a sea ice returning as liquid, too. Because <laughs> sea ice comes out of the poles, melts, and then the water goes back and freezes again as sea ice. So there's an ice latent effusion part, too, of that circuit. But that's a small one. OK, but so this one is just the warm water going one way and cold water replacing it part, which you might think of as warm water going this way, but turning it north of the and deep water coming back, cold water. So there's a net exchange of energy involved in that. OK, so now look at the different, now this is broken down by different basins. So here's the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Indian. The Pacific. Looks almost like the total. So on that, in both hemispheres, it's taking warm water away from the equator and bringing cold water back to replace it. So the overturning in the Pacific on that in energy terms looks like that. If we go back to our little Pacific diagram, which was this guy. Keep missing it by one. Here's our Pacific diagram. Here's the Antarctic, cold Antarctic bottom water coming in, warm Pacific deep water going that way, and then there's warmer water coming on the top. Which one wins, the upper cell or the lower cell? In terms of heat. Or are they both doing the right thing? All right, which way does this one take heat? Takes cold stuff from the poles to the equator, <laughs> which puts heat the other way. So warm stuff is going away from the equator, and cold stuff is coming in to replace it. What about the upper one? Cold stuff is going from the equator, and warm stuff is going back to replace it. So it looks like it might be backwards. But if you, this is why you have to be careful if you sum up the numbers, so what the temperature differences are, then that's what this little estimate tells us that actually the cold stuff going poleward, warm, sorry, cold stuff going equatorward, warm stuff going poleward is what's winning in terms of the volume of heat transport, the total amount of heat transport. And the same is true, this is a little bit harder, that was the North Pacific, this is the South Pacific. The South Pacific is actually going cold stuff toward the other pole, warm stuff coming in. So it's a southward transport of net heat. So it is poleward transport of warm stuff Equator with transport of cold stuff is winning. Okay? And it, so it does the same thing as the poleward transport of warm air in the Hadley cell, the equator with transport of cold air on net. Even though we see that there are these other cells that may be going the other way, if you add them all together, that's the one, the way that the Pacific goes on net. Or to put it in an even simpler way, if we just let that sun heat up the tropics and then mix it, it would look like this. The hot stuff would just escape to the poles. 
and then go back to spin. So the Pacific circulation is doing something that looks similar to just mixing away the excess heat at the equator. And the Indian is doing the same thing, except it doesn't have a North Indian Ocean. <laughs> so there is just the South Indian Ocean, which is the only Indian Ocean, and the South Indian Ocean also looks like a smaller version of the Pacific, because it's a smaller ocean. Okay, the Atlantic. What's happening in the Atlantic? Is it going poleward or equatorward? It's going north. It doesn't go poleward or equatorward. It goes north everywhere at every latitude. So the South Atlantic is going equatorward. The North Atlantic is going poleward which is very funny, and then you say, how does that possibly work? But then you go back to your little, to our plumbing diagram, which I missed by one again, and the plumbing diagram says there's one special water type, it's this North Atlantic deep water, it forms in the, la the northern end of the North Atlantic, and it doesn't outcrop again until it's in the ACC, so it does a unidirectional heat transport all the way from the Labrador Sea to the Southern Ocean. So it has the Atlantic has a special water type and that combined with the return flow to keep it going gives you a northward heat transport throughout the whole Atlantic. And so it's partly in the Gulf Stream, partly in the Brazil current, bringing that warm water all the way up in order to deposit it into the Gulf Stream and then have it go sorry, into the Labrador and Armageddon season and have it go down. Okay. This is another estimate. So Wunsch spends an awful lot of time talking about how well we know these numbers, <laughs> which is like, these are error bars are big. <laughs> and there are a lot of, one way to do this is to say, take the radiation as observed at the top of the atmosphere, subtract the weather models they tell us what's happening in the atmosphere and then everything that's left over the ocean just sorts out. Which is the way that this figure was made. This has no ocean observations in it. It just says the ocean has to do whatever didn't get done by the atmosphere. Which is kind of an interesting way to think about it. This one is a direct measurement, I think actually even using echo. Together, oh no, this is Ganeshaw and Wood. So this is an inverse model. But you can do it using echo. And this is what you get if you use echo from Winch's estimate. So you can directly do northward transport of heat, southward transport of heat. What's the difference? What does it look like? This is the kind of thing that would be fun to do for a paper four. And you can go to Winch and see what these are supposed to look like. This is a slightly different version of echo than the version we have, so the numbers would be a little different. That's something that's worth thinking about. And then the freshwater transport, how do you think the freshwater goes? And this is the answer, but what's the, what's the concept behind it? Where is it rainy in the world and where is it dry? The tropics are rainy. The 30s, 30s. the 30s are dry. So the different sides of the Hadley cell, the subsidence end or the uplift end. Uplift is the wet part, subsidence is the dry part. And then it actually gets wet again farther poleward of that. So you have an excess of fresh water being applied at the equator and near the poles and a deficit. So if the salinity was going to make its way back to keep itself uniform, it would do something like this. So it has a, that's good. There's an excess of water coming in here. So there's a northward transfer to fresh water and a southward transfer to fresh water. But then there's an equatorward flipping, bring the polar excess fresh water in to the subtropics as well. So it goes both directions. Um, that one, in, this one includes the seasonal cycle and this one doesn't. So <laughs> basically air bars get bigger when you try and figure out what the seasonal cycle of fresh water is. Yeah, and you and you could. And in fact, I I believe these numbers are not zero. 
but I don't think we measure them to be not zero, is maybe a safer way to put it. We don't actually know whether there is, it's very hard to tell whether there's like net more rainfall on the ocean or not, except we know that rivers run into it. So there's like sort of basic constraints on the existence, but like if you try to detect melting ice sheets by changes in salinity, it's really hard to do it. It's a very noisy system, the precipitation system, and the evaporation too. Okay, so we've been talking about this like the heat made this happen, or on this panel, the fresh water made this happen. And in the old days, that was what they said. They were like, cooling in the north drives a circulation that will overturn the ocean. Just like if you took, put cold water on the side of a on the side of a of a bathtub, it would wow. If you had warm water, <laughs> so if you um, so, but that is that. There's a problem with that, <laughs> which I'm gonna get to in a second. But Wunsch even objects to the so it when people were saying, oh, it's driven by fresh water plus heating and cooling. Therefore, let's call it the thermohaline circulation. It's the thing that's driven by temperatures and salinity. We should be already extremely suspicious of that because we know that the thermal wind in the gyre circulation is also by that definition a thermohaline circulation, but we know that it's wind driven because the wind sets it up. So there's some problems. So Wunsch's point is that calling anything a thermohaline circulation is a bad idea. One, because it could just be the circulation of mass, heat, and salt. It could be the abyssal circulation, the bottom part of that branch. It could be the meridional overturning, which we were just talking about. Or it could be the global conveyor, which is like this whole thing. It could be the circulation that's directly driven by the application of surface buoyancy forcing. So like, I cool here, what happens? Or it could be the circulation driven by density and pressure differences in the deep ocean, kind of thermal wind style. Or it could be something like the net export of a chemical susta substance, which is like a thermohaline in that there is like a salt involved and the transport of that salt is what you're talking about. So each of these is not a crazy reading of what you mean by thermohaline. It's not a very well-defined concept is the point. Does that make sense to everybody? So when you hear people talking about the thermohaline circulation, you could say, which one? Or you could say, what do you mean more precisely? What, 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 what are you talking about there? And normally they mean either the, let's see, they normally mean this one or this one, when what I would say are the most common usages. But this one is also part of the story too. Okay, so this is another slide that talks, says the same thing. Okay, why do I call this the meridional overturning circulation gas and not the thermohaline circulation gas? Well, we're talking about the thermohaline circulation in all those different ways, but the meridional overturning circulation is just unobservable. It is a quantity that we can calculate. How do we calculate it? We take the meridional velocity, north-south velocity, we integrate it all the way across each basin in x, and then we integrate it again in z from the surface down to some depth. So let me draw a cross-section what that means, because that's a little hard to think about. I have Suppose I have a northward flow in the surface waters and a southward flow in the bottom waters. This is my surface. This is my bottom. So I've already integrated in the x direction. This is the north direction. And so I have a net transport this way in the top and a net transport this way in the bottom. And this extra piece is an integral from here 
to there. So it's getting positive, 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 stop, decreasing, 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 decreasing. So that is a stream function, and it would look like this. This is now psi z. That is the stream function that goes with this velocity. So, yeah? So how do you know where to stop? Is it z equals z as the bottom of that triangle, right? So, if it's closed in my box, in my location, that is, if there's not like a leak out of this end, then it should come to zero at the bottom and the top. So it doesn't matter whether I start at the bottom and go to the top or start at the top and go to the bottom. This formula by convention starts at the top and goes toward the bottom. But the reason why we want to convert to a stream function is, so if this is an x integrated velocity, this is in meters squared per second. This would be in meters cubed per second. So this is a transport of volume of water per second. So this is the one that has to be conserved. It doesn't matter what the shape of my basin does. It doesn't matter whether the depth is changing. This is the one that tells you whether there's a leak in your pipe. If this one came to a small positive value, I would know that some of the water was not going back in that same circulation. I would have a net transport in that ocean basin toward the north. So maybe this is the North Atlantic and it goes up into the Arctic and doesn't come back that way. So that would be that. Does that make sense why people are thinking of this in terms of a stream function rather than in terms of this, which, I mean, you can add it up and it's, this is the process by which you add it up. So it's I'm kind of, it's sort of redundant to say this, but people like to think of the meridional overturning circulation as a stream function because it makes it easy to tell whether it's con conserved or not. Does that make sense to everybody? So we already saw a stream function in a different setting in the gyres. We had a stream function that was the sea surface height. That was proportional to our stream function. And so in that case, we had circulations going around pressure contours or sea surface height contours. And so we got used to the idea that when you pack those contours together, you have fast flow, like in the western boundary currents. And when they're, they're, when they're separated far apart, you have slow flow. And a closed loop implies that you're conserving the volume as you go around and around. So we're going to use the same kind of thinking about this. If I had fast surface flow, the stream function would have been like this. If I had fast flow at depth, the stream function would have been like this. Does that make sense? And as long as the value here equals the value there, I actually am not transporting water on net one direction or the other. I'm just overturning it. Okay? Does this sort of make sense? Yes? No? Please. So just to be clear, were you saying that Z is the next layer now? Sorry, Z is the total Z is just the vertical. So in the mixed layer, I might have a little interesting blob, but this is actually going all the way to the total depth of the ocean. So this is all the transport with the Antarctic bottom water and the North Atlantic deep water and all those things. And so we might actually have a much more interesting pattern with swerving back and forth, having kind of net things going this way and that way. But this is just says, if you want to keep track of the volume of water moving around, a stream function is an easier way to do it. It has the units of volume transport, its maximum is the amount of stuff going that way and the amount of stuff going that way in volume, right? So I've integrated over this. By the time I get to this midpoint, that is how much water per second is going by in volume. And also, if it comes back to the same value at the bottom, it's equal to the amount going that way. Yeah? I mostly have it. I just need to, I'm, so there are two. There are sort of two different z's in this equation. Yes. Because you're integrating d this one and this one. Yes. So those are sort of unrelated. Like yeah. So this is, an, is this is this is not a definite integral. This is z 
the depth to which I integrate, this is z, the coordinate. And so this one is now that playing one, fast and loose by way. saying this is the coordinate of the stream function, but that was really the bound on the integral of this one. So this is, if this is z prime, this is z prime, then this is z and z, the way that mathematicians like to write it. They don't like to do that same symbol reused in the same yeah. equation two different ways. Yeah. <laughs> For good reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but this doesn't have to be big H. This doesn't have to be the bottom. This is still a function of Z over here. So I'm not integrating top to bottom necessarily. I could give you a value of stream function at different depths all the way along. And that's what is That's what I was drawing over here on the right. So you just drew the, the potential line where psi is zero? On the graph. This this is the magnitude of psi as a function of depth and psi. Uh, so from integrating from zero to zero, uh, I get zero. Integrating from zero to here, I get some fraction of this northward flow. Integrating halfway, I get the whole northward flow, but none of the southward flow. Integrating here, I get the northward minus the southward, and I'm back at zero. So let me show you, we'll, we'll look at some maps of it and it'll make a little more sense. And if you want to be really fancy, which I'm sure you do, you can actually write a stream, fun a stream function is a three-dimensional object whose curl is a velocity field. So this is a stream function in this axis, in the horizontal axis in the zonal direction. And we, our stream function that we've been using to talk about the, geos, the gyre flow is a vertical component of stream function. And so there is sort of a more elaborate potential flow formulation of this, even though. Sorry, the, the size in that large matrix that you just described. Have different units. Uh, yeah, they're, they're not the same as the psi from the previous slide. These are lowercase psi. <laughs> and this is a capital psi. <laughs> because this one is also integrated along the axis of it in order to make it a volume transport. This is a velocity times length, not times length squared, just try size. So this is sort of the potential flow. I know, this is why people don't like these two different definitions, they're a little funny. Because it's convenient to integrate this one in x to get volume conservation in part of it. But when you do that, the derivative of this is no longer the velocity, it's the velocity integrated in x. Okay, so it's sort of okay. So this is the volume transport stream function and this is maybe the velocity stream function. Okay. Length squared per time rather than length cubed per time. Okay. And this is just doing the same, this is just messing around with how we do it for the for the gyre flow, and you can do it for the MOC, and you can do these integrals all carefully. So all these pieces are laid out if you want to think this through. But let's look at some maps of that one, the regular integrated one, because this is where it starts to make sense. Okay, here is the Atlantic meridional overturning stream function. It has a number 20 on it, 20 sphere drops. So how big was the gyre circulation in sphere drops in the North Atlantic? Anybody remember? It's like 30. So the Gulf Stream going north carries about 30 sphere drops north, and the sphere drop flow going south carries about 30 sphere drops going south. They're not quite equal to each other because the sphere drop doesn't return all that water. Some of that water goes in this circulation. How much? 20 sphere drops. 20 sphere drops goes northward to the top and comes back at the bottom. And this is the first kilometer, and then here's the rest of them. <laughs> and so this is compressed. I mean, this is an expanded axis. So which one is faster in velocity terms, the northward part or the southward part? They're the same quantity of integrated 
but the northward goes in less of a depth range. So it's like the contours of that stream function are more tightly packed. So this flow is actually faster than that flow in terms of velocities. Okay. Yeah, so it's going this way, comes down, and it goes that way. And when it goes that way, it means below one, like whole bottom, right? Yeah, so this is the, so it's this is what I'm showing. Here we go, and on that axis, it says this is happening about one kilometer. That the northward bit goes that way, and the southward bit goes that way. And so this is the North Atlantic deep water coming down along these streamlines. The flow is go the flow travel in the stream function, the flow travels along the streamline, so there's a little bit that's just recirculating right here. This is the North Atlantic deep water coming down from the surface down and traveling back at around two kilometers depth. If we look at the global, we can see the North Atlantic deep water. We can see the North Atlantic deep water here. Is still imprinted even on the global circulation because there's not a whole lot of strong overturning in the Pacific and there's not a North Indian Ocean. So the North Atlantic winds in terms of the global integrated, so that 20 there is almost the same as this 20 here, there's just 20 sphere drops of that direction of overturning. But now we can see, hey look, here's the Antarctic bottom water filling out. And how big is that number? can't read it, I think it's 12. 12 sphere drops going this way, 12 sphere drops coming back this way. And you can see that these are kind of combined together, so it's not so obvious like which is which cell a little, but that's why we knew the water mass analysis. We could go and look and see which had which temperatures and which salinities riding along these guys. And then this huge overturning is the Southern Ocean overturning, and that's there's Ekman transport here, and then a return flow below is overturning and overturning and overturning the Southern Ocean. We'll talk more about that a different day. I think we have another day to talk about that. Um, I think this is too complicated. All right. Another way, one of the other cool things about the stream function is that I could have done this in density space not in Z space. <laughs> and so you can still draw these closed contours, but now it's not just, so this is the same as this in terms of the mass transported, but now it says, well, when I'm going this way and going back that way, I'm only going between like 37 and a half to 36 and a half um, kilograms per cubic meter anomaly. So in order to change densities, to go like this, what do I have to do? Change temperature or change salinity. So where do I have to be if I want to change my temperature and my salinity a lot? Uh, the Probably at the surface. I could also do it by mixing. So typically this angle is the surface angle. So that's showing the surface transformation of the water. And then the way you get from down here to up there is something like an upwelling and mixing at the equator or something like that. So this is a helpful, this has different complementary information to that. Still describing the meridional overturning, but describing it in terms of transformation of water types rather than geographic locations. Um, all right, whatever. I mean, we did talk about this before. You guys remember the subtropical cell? So this is the Ekman pumping over here and then the tropical upwelling. That's hiding up here. Subtropical cells are there too. So we're capturing part of what we were calling gyre dynamics before also has a meridional component, overturning component. So the, but this is, wind driven, right? We went through the whole process to say Ekman is converging and that pushes the water down and that does the whole thing. It's not thermohaline, but it for sure is on the meridional overturning figure. 
That's part of the reason why defining a thermohaline circulation is hard to do. The thing that causes overturning might actually have nothing to do with thermohaline stuff. It might have all the more to do with Ekman stuff, but it still causes an overturning. And the same is true here in the Southern Ocean. It's an Ekman-driven overturning in some sense. And so it's wind-driven, even though it is definitely moving heat around and it makes a big impact on the heat budget. It's got a wind source of motion. So it's not clean to separate these based on their forcing mechanism. It's much cleaner to break, do them based on just their orientation. Like, are they a stream function in the horizontal, a stream function in the vertical? That's clear and easy to define. But whether the gyre is driven by convection or the dryer is driven by winds, you can get all tangled up in the subpolar gyres trying to figure that out. Whether the, <laughs> whether the meridional overturning is driven by winds or driven by thermohaline effects doesn't really matter. It is what it is. We can change the forcing and we can see how it responds. So that's the power of this more mathematical definition of what's going on is that you can more cleanly delineate an observable and a forcing mechanism which is not observable directly. All right. So here's the overturning circulation of subtropical gyres. Okay. Um, I want to even talk about this. Let me see where I was going after this. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this quickly. All right. So um, when we did Stommel, remember we had this funny thing where we had Ekman pumping from the top and then bottom Ekman layer at the bottom? We can play the same game for the vorticity budget just of the abyssal flow. And there, suppose we have some localized, you know, lab, lab seawater that comes down and it fills down to a deep layer. Then it spreads out. And for that particular water type, we observe that it goes up and mixes up upward. We now have stretching, vortex stretching, and vortex squashing. What's the spare drip relation going to tell us about that? Or what's our vorticity balance going to tell us about that? When we had Ekman driven pumping, what happened to the those columns? We squashed them and then what do they do? The vorticity decreases when you squash them. And so they could either start spinning anticyclonically, but then we said, oh no, their Rossby number is small, they can't do that. So what do they do if, they're, if they are to avoid spinning anticyclonically? They go to a different latitude. So if they're spinning more slowly, if they're being compressed, they head towards the equator. If they're being stretched, they head towards the pole. So we can play the same game on the abyssal waters. So this is the stommel ahrens abyssal theory. Here I'm squashing, I should be heading equatorward. Here I'm stretching, I should be heading poleward. And we can go through that game and try and make some maps of that. So if I have a source up here at the northern end of the North Atlantic, and then I have upwelling uniformly throughout from the abyssal layer up, I could get a flow that goes like this, where I have all of the upwelling regions, I have a poleward flow. But the problem is, is that it doesn't cleanly hook up because I'm heading, here's my source of deep water, and all of the interior flow is going toward the source rather than away from the source. So, Stommel and Ahrens, being very clever people and also doing lab experiments, let's check on this, figured, all oh, right, we just use the same trick that Stommel used to explain the western boundary currents. If there's a fast flowing boundary current, it has to be on the west side, and then it can have bottom drag, and the bottom drag will give you whatever sign of vorticity removal you needed to make the whole budget work. So they say, if you have a source up here, what it should do is it should just run down the western boundary in the abyssal water. At the equator, it can zoom over to the side, 
actually at any latitude, it can zoom to the side and then return back so that the source here equals this minus the upwelling of those parts and you actually can close the budget. And you can get more complicated flows by putting the source say over here and then it goes this way and then that way and then that way <laughs> to get back or you can put it a negative source, a sink, and then you get reverse flow. So they went through this whole kind of setup of, of things, but pretty much wherever you locate the source, you tend to drive these western boundary currents. They are deep western boundary currents in the abyss. So they did all this in the lab and they were just like, oh, this is cool, fun stuff. Someone at Woods Hole, Bruce Warren, took this seriously and went out and put a current meter at the bottom of the ocean, which had never really been done before because nobody thought there were any currents down there because what's going to drive it? They assumed that this thermohaline flow would be really broad and wide, but this said, no, you should always have these western boundary currents with it. And when you do that, you see something like this. There are very intense deep western boundary currents connecting the abyss all around the world. And there are ones on the mid-Atlantic ridges as well, on the mid-ocean ridges. So this is one of the few times where theory predicted something and then they went and found it later. But this, this prediction of deep western boundary currents is sort of intimately related to the gyre flow, but then with this extra little piece of upwelling and convection driving the abyssal circulation. Yeah. Why can't it be on the eastern boundary? It's this, exactly the same argument that we did for why, how the vorticity budget works for the gyre. If you put it on the eastern side, so this is a vorticity dynamics story. This is upwelling everywhere makes poleward motion in this case. So the, that's what vorticity tells you. So if you want to violate that and you want to put a bottom drag in order to cancel that vorticity balance out, you can only do it on the western side. If I did it on the eastern side, I would exacerbate the problem. So western boundary currents are freebies, as is zonal transport, because zonal transport doesn't affect your vorticity. So you can close the budget however you want with western boundary currents and zonal currents, but this part is specified by the net upwelling. So that was the amazing discovery, and then people were very excited. And this is the kind of mean flow pattern you get. Um, and this is whatever. This is showing 20 year, whatever. This is a, a figure from a bunch. Then you start thinking, well, wait, how is that flow? Is that going to be steady down there? And what about all those eddies we saw at the surface? And how fast is this going to be? Maybe we should look at oxygen and see whether this fast flowing water also has a clean signature in oxygen. And it doesn't, really. The oxygen, while it has some expression on the kind of deep western boundary current, so this is North Atlantic again, sorry, it's really blurry. So here's the high oxygen. So it, that's the freshest water, the most recently on the surface. And you would expect to see a nice streak of high oxygen water along the western boundary current. But you don't. You see a big blob of oxygen spreading out. So. That mean circulation is not really dominating the spreading of the water masses. So that means that the, just like eddies are important for doing some stirring in the surface, they're important for doing stirring in the deep. But actually, in the deep, the mean currents are relatively weak. The eddies are really quite strong. So the eddies are doing most of the spreading out of that deep water. So you don't get a narrow, cold western boundary current as much as you might think if you did the steady theory, some combination of the eddy part and the mean part. Um, here's oxygen at 4,000 meters. So you don't really, so this is the Pacific. Here there's no water mass formation region. So this in some sense is the, here's the Antarctic bottom water coming in but it doesn't come in in like a western boundary. It doesn't match those patterns of upwelling. So you could say part of the story is that maybe that upwelling is not uniform. Maybe it's focused over topography, like where the mixing is going on. Or maybe it's the eddies. But it's, the story is not as simple as what Stommel and Aaron said, even though they did predict deep western boundary currents exist, and they do. So there's more on this story to figure out. 
Okay, I think I'm almost at the end. And this is a paper showing exactly that. Um, okay. What was this stuff? This is kind of, okay. <laughs> One way that people have tried to figure this out <laughs> is like, where did the energy come from? So if I make, if I make deep, suppose I'm at the pole and I make stuff get colder. What does it do? It sinks, right? And then we want to draw our meridional overturning circulation that would connect that loop. So this part's happy, and then this part's happy. You know, like the cold water would sink and then it would kind of spread out. That's all fine, as we just talked about with the abyssal circulation. How do I get the cold water here to go up? I could do upwelling, and so upwelling has, does it take energy to do that? It does. I'm lifting denser stuff and replacing surface waters with denser stuff. So upwelling, where does the energy for upwelling come from? From the wind. I could also do it with tides. I could just do mixing. And so the tides would be sloshing around and maybe they're mixing this water with water above it. I could also do it with upwelling the Southern Ocean. So Ekman divergences in the Southern Ocean. So in order to try and predict the strength of this overturning, you could say, you could talk about whether the water is dense enough to sink. So that's cold and also fresh. Or you could talk about this side of the story. Does it have enough energy to close the budget? Because if it doesn't have enough energy, all it'll do is just the ocean will fill up with cold stuff and leave a thin layer at the top where the gyres and stuff are living. This side of the story is pretty useful for thinking about paleoclimate. One of the main ways that it can change is what if you have this big glacier, not here, like, or big ice sheets and glaciers, and then you melt them and you dump a lot of fresh water in. What do you think happens? Down. It's going to slow down. It's going to make this water more buoyant than it would have otherwise been. And so harder or just less likely to sink all the way to the bottom. So that is called a posing experiment when you do that in a model, where you just dump a bunch of fresh water in to simulate the melting of an ice sheet and see what happens. And the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation is quite sensitive to hosing experiments. There is another experiment that we're doing right now, which is partly a warming experiment and partly a hosing experiment. We are heating the poles faster than everywhere else in the world because of climate change, the polar amplification. We'll talk about that later. But we are also melting the ice sheets as part of that heating process. We believe that the overturning circulation has slowed by something like 10% already. By the end of the 22nd century, it may be considerably slow. So this system is potentially in flux now. So this is one of the reasons why people are worried about it. But we can try and go to the other end and figure out where the energy comes from, from this side, because maybe we could just suck it down if we had more enough energy over here. Like it doesn't matter how, whether it's cold or hot or whatever, you're gonna keep pumping it back up by mixing. So whatever, you know, in that sense, you say, I'm always making this water warmer, 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 because I'm mixing, mixing, mixing. And if this was warmer, it would still fall down because eventually if it slowed for a while, this warm stuff would move back and then it would be warmer underneath and it would start going again. So maybe it's not the cooling that drives the circulation, it's the upwelling. Like which is the tail and which is the dog? It's not so obvious. So this is an attempt to try and close the energy budget of the ocean with that one sitting here in the internal tides essentially the tides are part of that and maybe there's a conversion between internal waves and mixing but as you can see most of this figure is filled in with question marks because it's really really hard to track where the energy goes once it gets in the ocean it starts off we know how much wind blows so we can figure out how much energy that's putting in we know how much Tidal energy is going in. Does anybody know how we get that, actually? It's a really cool method. We know how much the tides are displaced. 
expensive to say. But what about the deep ties that we're not watching? Mm -hmm. We actually know that because we're we sh are shooting a laser against the moon, and we can see how f and how the moon's separation from us is changing over time, which is indirectly a measure of the tides, because it would have the same separation if there were no tides, but instead it's dissipating energy through the tides, so that system is evolving. So anyway, that's a cool thing. Um, heating and cooling has a big zero on it. We'll come back to that in a second. Evaporation and precipitation has a big zero on it. Geothermal and atmospheric pressure. Geothermal is a small amount because you're heating at the bottom. Atmospheric pressure is a small amount. You actually, if you, the problem with the ocean is that you're changing the density at the same level that you're changing the density the other way. So if you heat at the surface and you also cool at the surface, there's actually no energy produced in that process. This is sort of a technicality of thermodynamics. But the efficiency of a, a heat engine, something that takes warm stuff and lets it go up and expand and then cools it at a different, t and then cools it and makes a cycle, the amount of energy you can extract. So like how perfect of a refrigerator can you build? Or how good can your heat pump be? The second law of thermodynamics in liquid form says that there is no energy if you're heating and cooling or alternatively freshening and salinifying happen at the same pressure. So these guys actually have zeros on them because they're not sources of energy. But we know that they matter. They are affecting the whole thermohaline circulation. Didn't that the whole thing? And then we talk about it as being driven by that. So this is why energy is really complicated. So we don't understand how to fill in these boxes and we don't know how to link it back to this part of the circulation. And models do a terrible job of this because this is just some big old kappa that I set to a number that I pick out of a hat that makes the circulation look good. But I don't know how kappa depends on paleoclimate changes, and I don't know how kappa depends on changes to the cooling and heating and wind and stratification and other things. So this is a big mess. So this part of the problem is really hard. We don't have a good handle on how to connect the physics of what we think is happening to this overturning that we can observe and we can model, but we don't really know whether our models are just matching today's conditions or whether they'll match tomorrow's conditions. So the last point I wanted to talk about, oh, we're gonna skip over the Stommel models. Will the MOC shut down? <laughs> so we talked about, did we talk about this already? This is the, the, the one where it's really noisy and then you do the transect. We talked about this in the statistics at the beginning. But, um, and then there's this other interesting paper which says that it has already started shutting down, but it's based on remote pieces of evidence. This is a really hard problem. We ha now have rapid, this red squiggly line. That red squiggly line is true. We're pretty sure that we know how to monitor this now. But we've only been looking since about 2005. This longer black line is the echo model, monthly variations, and sorry, this is spare drifts of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. So it's that, it's the peak of that overturning. And so it kind of wobbles around, so it's 15 plus or minus five. And this is the thing that would shut down if the Gulf Stream, if that whole circuit was gonna turn down, if we had, if Greenland was melting fast enough to shut this down, we would see it here, presumably. But do we see it or not? It's hard to tell. <laughs> it's just kind of wobbling around. And we definitely, we probably don't see it here, but then there's this dip, and actually they were about to cut funding right here, and then that <laughs> happened. <laughs> and they were like, oh my God, it's going right now. And so then they got totally funded for like another few decades. <laughs> so <laughs> we don't know what's going on. It's very hard to predict, but that is part of the situation. So I think that's, the take on what the AMOC is doing or how we think about it anyway. I, I noticed that immediately after we got funding, the AMOC went right back up. Oh, it popped right back up to so higher levels than it was at before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think that's a causal relationship. <laughs> I, think, I don't think so. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, it certainly drove an awful lot of interest when this went down.
but you have to be really careful. And so the traditional methods of measurement, like you know those those old sampling, like sorry, this this table, they show a steady decrease, but it's a steady decrease of a very noisy wobble. And this is a couple of different models, different mo different versions of echo and whatever, and you can see they all disagree. So we don't really have the observational constraints on this until we get into the rapid era over here where we're actually directly observing. Okay. And then there are two other versions of rapid, and one in the South Atlantic called SAMOC, and then one farther north than rapid that has the best acronym of all time. It's called OSNAP. <laughs> so, which is a, it's very bold if you think you're going to build a multi million, you know, $10 million instrument and call it OSNAP. <laughs> all right. Um, everybody's looking at papers. Everybody can see them for the reviewing stage. Okay. Thanks.